Hello, Central Illinois, and welcome to our Viewing Room Live event, Peoria and the Miracle Drug. We're happy to have all of you here with us tonight as we talk with our special guests about uh, penicillin and Peoria's role in the discovery of the mass production of penicillin. Uh, tonight we have with us Lisa Gates, who is the secretary of our board of directors and the VP of marketing at, and communications at RLI here in Peoria. And we're also joined by uh, Washington Post reporter and free, freelance uh, journalist Diane Bernard. Thank you, Diane, uh, for joining us tonight. Lottie Fittis, our curator of history, is on the call, as well as myself, uh, Renee Kerrigan. Uh, I am the curator of science at the museum. So uh, we're excited to be talking about penicillin uh, tonight and all uh, the important part Peoria played in the penicillin story. So I'm going to share my screen to share a few images. Uh, long ago, there was an urgent need for a miracle drug. During World War II, our soldiers were dying at alarming rates, but not uh, from as much from fire as from infection. Infection was a real problem. And we knew there was this drug, penicillin, that could save soldiers' lives. It could help people uh, who had bad infections recover. But we couldn't figure out, we the scientific community, couldn't figure out how to mass produce penicillin. It was incredibly tricky to mass produce. And it was discovered uh, by Alexander Fleming in 1928. And Diana is going to be talking a little bit more about that. Um, but for a long time, for over a decade, um, the mass production of penicillin, it was that we couldn't figure it out. Scientists and um, and assistants were actually doing cultures of penicillin in bedpans at one point to try to get enough surface area to mass produce uh, the drug until the drug was brought to Peoria to our National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research Lab, also called the USDA lab in Peoria or most often by residents, the Ag Lab. The Ag Lab was really good at uh, doing mass production and using corn steep liquors and uh, figuring out some of these tricky things that had to do with penicillin. And here in Peoria, the mass production was figured out. We at the Peoria Riverfront Museum are lucky to have some of the original stronger strain of penicillin that was discovered on a moldy cantaloupe on a market in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, in our collection, it is uh, frozen, so it's no longer growing, um, but they're really kind of cool to see. And these um, penicillin strains are actually on display right now uh, on the lower level of the museum. So you're welcome to stop in sometime uh, to see them. And I should say also that if any of our viewers have any questions for our speakers today, please feel free to leave us a comment uh, on the comment feed on Facebook and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Uh, so we're just excited to talk a little bit more about this um, important part of Peoria's history. And uh, Lisa is going to tell us a little bit about her family's connection to the penicillin story. Thank you, Renee. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Lisa Gates and I'm a proud member of the Peoria Riverfront Museum Board of Directors. And my own personal thread in the fabric of the remarkable story of the mass production of penicillin is that my, my own grandmother, Martha Topping, was a chemist that worked on the penicillin project at the Ag Lab. So today I would just wanted to share a little bit about her story and I'm grateful for the Riverfront Museum for the opportunity to do so. Um, she, my grandmother, pictured here, was both uh, a beauty and had brains. She was born and raised in Peoria, Illinois, and attended Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. She uh, graduated college in 1941 and with a degree in chemistry and decided to return home to Peoria and was lucky enough to secure a position at the Ag Lab. Um, and through her career there from 1941 to 1944, 
she uh, worked on the penicillin project her entire the entire time. Um, unfortunately, we really don't know a whole lot about the specific work that she did there, or uh, really some of the the individuals she worked with. She perhaps was a colleague of Moldy Mary, but we're not sure because at that point in time, everything about the project was highly classified, and all of those files and records and photos from the time. Um, were sent to and still reside in Washington, D.C., actually. But I think that um, she was certainly a trailblazer for, for women in chemists alike during her time and, um, you know, really was, was amazing in, in the contribution she was able to make to the project at that point in, in history. Um, as I mentioned, she, she actually left in 1944 to start a family. She had met my my grandfather, a dashing young Caterpillar engineer, and um, decided to leave to, to start a family. But had she stayed for just one more year uh, in 1945, she would have had the opportunity to meet Alexander Fleming, who, as Renee mentioned, it was the, the chemist or the uh, scientist who discovered penicillin. Since that year, he actually made a trip to the Ag Lab, which is the great picture that's shown on your screen now, Alexander is actually the gentleman in the front in the suit with the bow tie. Um, so she missed meeting him just by a year, which incidentally was the same year that he won the Nobel Prize for his, his work on penicillin. Um, but really, I think all in all, my, my grandmother's story is just one of many of the unsung heroes that, that worked, the men and women that worked behind the scenes to help bring arguably one of the most important medical advancements in modern times to market. And it certainly also re represents some of the local pride we have here in Peoria on the pivotal role that our community has played over time in the uh, mass production of penicillin. So with that, Renee, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> and it's really wonderful to hear um, a, a little bit of that human story because we we talk about Alexander Fleming and we talk about in Peoria we might know the name Andrew Moyer who led the led the team in Peoria figuring out the mass production but of course there were hundreds of scientists um, probably more than that who worked on this project and they all of their contributions are important um, well Diane I know that you wrote a fantastic article on penicillin for the Washington Post uh, and how it and how the um, the search for that penicillin uh, drug and its mass production has some parallels with the world that we are living in today. So uh, I'd love if you could talk a little bit about that, that your article and, and the penicillin story. Okay, great. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. And also, uh, just to start off with Lisa, the story about your grandmother is really interesting and really cool. I also think it's really interesting to see how many women scientists played a role at the Peoria lab. I think it was really interesting, in addition to Moldy Mary. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, which I'll get into a little further on. But um, at any rate, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I write for the Washington Post, the Retropolis section. And what we do is we look at history, moments in history relevant to the news today. So when the pandemic first started back in March, my editor asked me to start thinking of stories that might be relevant. And I noticed a lot of people writing about the 1918 pandemic. That's the most obvious uh, correlation. But I started digging a little bit deeper. And then in April, uh, the Trump administration announced Operation Warp Speed. And that was that is a public-private partnership uh, to develop vaccines for COVID-19 and for cures for COVID-19. So I started, it rang a bell to me. And then I remember my husband, I worked for Pfizer at one point, and he told me that Pfizer was involved in producing penicillin during the war. So I did a little more digging and I found out, wow, there's this whole story here that really does parallel what's going on with the government now, uh, linking up with pharmacy companies and trying to get cures for a deadly disease. And uh, back in at the turn of the century, the deadly disease was bacterial infections. Um, that was something like back then, you would get a blister or a scratch, it would get infected and it would kill you because there were no cures for it. There was nothing at all they could do until the 1930s, but I'm getting ahead of myself. At any rate, just to get into the penicillin story, as Renee mentioned, 
<coughs> Alexander Fleming discovered uh, penicillin pretty much quite by accident, actually. He was working with some uh, substance in Petri dishes excuse me, and overnight he left them near his window. And the next day he came in and he noticed mold had developed on the top of the Petri dishes. So he became fascinated with the mold and started extracting it and experimenting with it. And he soon found out it had really great antibacterial properties. And he began researching more, but he kept coming up against one terrible problem. He could not extract a lot of the substance. Uh, penicillin, the mold, is notoriously unstable, and it was really difficult to extract enough of it to experiment with. So Fleming grew frustrated and basically put it aside, but he did write one paper about it. And that one paper got into the hands of a man named Howard Florey in 1939, 11 years later. And Howard Florey um, began experimenting uh, with penicillin. He was in Oxford and uh, he actually approached the Rockefeller Institute in the United States who backed a lab set up at Oxford University that began experimenting with penicillin. This is the first all, you know, complete lab devoted to studying penicillin. So um, a Flory brought in a, a chemist named Ernst Chain from Germany, who later went on to win the Nobel Prize with him, and an assistant named Norman Heatley. And um, they started experimenting with it, and they saw, again, like Fleming, that it had a great antibacterial act um, potential. Um, up until that, in 1939, they had to, the German science, German scientists had invented sulfa drugs, um, which could be used to treat infections. But unfortunately, the problem with sulfa drugs is they had terrible side effects like nausea and vomiting, and it would make you break out in a whole body rash. So for a lot of people, they couldn't tolerate sulfa drugs. The cure was worse than the infection itself sometimes for people. So um, in the Oxford lab, they knew that um, they were onto something with their experiments. So by August of 1940, the Oxford lab researchers had experimented on cats, mice, and rabbits, and they discovered that um, actually penicillin cured bacterial infections in those animals with no side effects whatsoever, no toxic side effects. So they immediately started to see, wow, we're really onto something here. The problem they had, though, is in 1940 in Great Britain, they were in the middle of World War II. And unfortunately, the lab um, and scientists suffered as a result of this. Everything was going towards the war effort. So the lab at Oxford was really not very well equipped. In fact, the author I interviewed, whose book I read uh, to research this, said that it was like an elementary school lab. You know, they had no burners. They had no uh, flasks or test tubes or whatever material you would have. And in fact, they um, didn't have enough Petri dishes and they got a donation of bedpans from a nearby hospital and they began to grow penicillin in the bedpans as Renee mentioned earlier. Um, so what you had in the Oxford lab was basically hundreds of bedpans lining the laboratory and also in classrooms all around so they could extract the mold from the bedpans. They were still using Fleming's, Fleming's approach to doing it. So um, after experimenting on animals, they began an experiment on a human. The first man that they experimented on was a policeman, and he had cut his face in a rose garden with a thorn, and it became infected, and soon his whole body was infected, and he was in the hospital for months. They had to remove his eye because it became infected, so they thought, here's a good candidate for this and they treated him with about 200 milligrams of penicillin. And like overnight, he got better. You know, they saw a complete uh, disappearance of his symptoms. The only problem was they didn't have enough to treat him for a full course. They used a tablespoon of penicillin and that basically uh, ended the supply of penicillin in Great Britain at the time. So unfortunately, um, they gave as much as they could and the man eventually died, actually. I can go more into that experiment later, but because it's a really interesting story. So after that, um, once they saw the great re recovery, Flory reached out again to the Rockefeller Institute and explained the problem and the potential that penicillin had to cure infections in humans. So what he did was he offered to show American, uh, the American government and American um, 
pharmaceutical companies how to produce penicillin mold and exchange if they could mass produce more of it, he would get a kilo of penicillin to continue his experiments. But little did he know how successful the Americans would be. So in July of 1941, before America was in World War II, Florey and Heatley went to the United States and the first place they went to was the lab in Peoria, uh, the USDA lab. And um, I see there that's Andrew Moyer. One of the first people they spoke to was Andrew Moyer, who was head of the deep tank fermentation department. And he got the idea that instead of growing mold on the surface of bedpans using different materials, why not sub submerge the mold and ferment it so that you could uh, produce much more of it. Um, and so that's what they did. They used a substance called steep corn liquor, which is a byproduct of corn and which was in abundance in the Midwest at the time. Um, so um, they used that and eventually it really yielded huge amounts of penicillin. Um, so for example, uh, from January to May of 1942, they produced 400 million units of penicillin. That's how much was manufactured, which is a great big change from a tablespoonful <laughs> of just a year earlier. So while this was going on, Heatley stayed in Peoria to help continue with the penicillin experiments. And Flory went ahead and began meeting with Pfizer, Eli Lilly, and Merck, all these pharmaceutical companies, to get them invested in experimenting with penicillin as well. And eventually he reached the highest levels of government, like the War Production Board, and they all formed this public-private partnership, very much like Operation Warp Speed today, and began developing penicillin. So by, um, <coughs> excuse me, July of 1943, the War Production Board had plans to mass produce enough penicillin to give to all of the Allied soldiers fighting in the war. And their ultimate goal was to equip all of them with penicillin enough for D-Day in 1944. That's what they were working towards. So as we all know, D-Day was a huge success. And a lot of people say it's because of the penicillin that was mass produced in Peoria, it played a huge role in being able to save a lot of soldiers. So penicillin ushered in the age of antibiotics and it basically changed the course of, of modern life actually with much longer lifespans because people didn't die of just you know getting stuck with a thorn in a garden. Oh, I see there that's Moldy Mary. Um, <laughs> I. Renee, right. can you tell us a little bit more about Moldy Mary? Yes, so yeah, I like to I think my, uh, my, my talk yeah. here. Um, but um, on the left there is Moldy Mary. She actually played a very important role in the Peoria lab. Um, while they were experimenting with penicillin, they needed actual mold from, you know, moldy fruit or anything um, that had gone bad that started developing a mold. And Mary was sent out every other day to go to markets in Peoria to find the moldiest piece of fruit or vegetable or anything she could find that she could bring back to the lab and they could use to start developing penicillin. So anyway, she eventually brought back a cantaloupe that had the strongest strain of penicillin. I assume that's what you have in your museum, yes. the strain from the moldy cantaloupe. But apparently that mold was so strong that it became the ancestor for all of penicillin today, actually. And Moldy Mary, I know it's a terrible nickname, but Mary Hunt plays a really big role in um, obtaining that mold. They actually, I believe, Diane, there was even a, a contest where people were asked to uh, send in different mold samples uh, oh, because, really? as you said, you know, the goal was to find a stronger strain, the original strain um, of penicillin that Alexander Fleming was experimenting with wasn't nearly as strong as the strain that was discovered on this cantaloupe. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So it does make a romantic picture, a, a person in the lab, a, a science a scientist in the lab out looking for different moldy fruits to uh -huh. explain. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a funny thing to do, but in truth, it was like the essential core of their experimentation was finding the best mold possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, this is an image from the National Archives. Um, this was uh, something that came out during World War II um, while they were doing, while they were mass producing it uh, through Peoria and through some of the pharmaceutical companies. 
Um, but anyway, they did a mass drive through the War Production Board uh, to get people invested in the idea of mass producing and also conserving penicillin and using it for the soldiers. It was a big part of the war effort. Actually, they um, said that during the war, producing penicillin came in second next to producing the bomb, um, mm. uh, the Manhattan Project. That was the, the top priority for the War Production Board was first the Manhattan Project and second was penicillin actually. That's amazing. It gives you a sense of uh, of how important the um, drug was for right. the war effort mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to guard against soldiers' infections. Right. Um, yeah, really you... changed the... I'm sorry, does someone talk? No, nope, sorry. Go ahead, Diane. Okay, it really changed a lot of people's lives. I interviewed someone who wrote a novel, actually, based on the race to um, mass-produce penicillin. And she told me that when she gave talks for her book, she had so many people raise their hands and ask questions and tell her stories about how when they were kids, their brother or sister got bit, uh, stung by a bee or got um, you know, a scratch on their knee that got infected and eventually they died. So you know, life expectancy was really low. It was like, I think 47 was the life expectancy at the turn of the century. And a lot of that was because bacterial infections especially in kids, you know, who don't wash up right away. Bacterial infections were so common and killed people, so. Yeah, and an interesting addition to the, the story I told earlier is, you know, my grandmother helped with the mass production of penicillin and only a few years after that, when it was more widely available, it actually helped uh, my one of my, my husband's aunt recover from a mastoid infection, which would have been very hard to recover from had had penicillin not been available. So it's right. kind of amazing to see that that come full circle, even in my own family. That um, that you know the the power that the drug had and and the tremendous benefits that many individuals were able to to get from it. Yeah, she was a pioneer, actually, especially being a woman chemist at the time. Mm -hmm. There were very few women in science who were actually working in the field. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, one thing I, I noticed when you were speaking, uh, Diane, about the uh, parallel between the public-private partnerships with the, the search for the vaccine for COVID-19 and with the search for the uh, uh, discovery on how to mass produce penicillin, uh, another thing that came to mind for me, I'm as well as being the curator of science at the museum, I'm the planetarium director, so space uh -huh. is always on my mind. Uh -huh. uh, it reminded me of the moonshot. And it took so many people from various industries, from right. uh, government uh, work and in private work to develop the technology to get us to the moon. Uh, it's very high priority for the government uh, in the 1960s, obviously. So a similar sort of drive across industry, uh, public and private. Yeah, you know, another thing that made me think to look into penicillin uh, to write as a story was when the pandemic first started, there were distilleries that um, were uh, not working um, because, well, anyway, they're, um, they decide they weren't selling as much alcohol, though that seems uh, uh, counter to intuitive to what's going on in the pandemic. But at any rate, they began shifting production over to making hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. And what the government did at the time, this is back in March and April, they loosened the restrictions that they had on producing anything other than liquor or alcohol because this they saw this was a public need. So again, that became another public-private partnership during the COVID era where um, a lot of hand sanitizer now is made by distilleries around the country. Yeah, Diane, you would, you, would you be able to talk just a little bit about how the the actual strains of penicillin how that actually made its way to Peoria and how you know that connection again from from Europe and and how that ended up here in Peoria right yeah well um, I mentioned that Howard Flory he headed up the Oxford lab he yep. and Norman Heatley came over <clears throat> and actually, it was a, a very um, dangerous flight. They came from Portugal. They went from England to Portugal. Um, and then they took the Pan Am Clipper, which is 
uh, famous uh, flight that went from Europe to the United States. In fact, it was so famous that reporters would come and just report on who was getting off the plane <laughs> at the time, just like when ocean liners would leave and reporters yeah. would come and report on that. So um, Flory packed his bag very um, uh, strategically. And so he took enough of the strain of the penicillin that they had from the Oxford lab and he packed it up in very secure containers. And basically he sat the entire flight with that um, substance on his lap in a briefcase. He never let go of the briefcase. He sat there hugging it actually. And uh, finally, when they got to the United States, he was able to put it aside. But that's how the strain actually got over from Europe. It came from the Oxford lab actually, and it was very guarded until they were able to get to Peoria and start experimenting. Diane, could you talk a little bit about um, what happened? So obviously the tur real turning point is the penicillin is in Peoria, the cantaloupe, it's able to be mass produced. What is the next steps with the penicillin? What happens, um, what drug companies were involved in terms of getting it actually out um, to the public or to the allied soldiers? Oh, well, that's an interesting question, actually, because um, Pfizer, Eli Lilly, and Merck were the big three pharmaceutical companies that started mass producing it. Um, Pfizer was first, actually, instead of using steep corn liquor, they had citric acid left over from other drugs that they made, and they began submerging and doing deep tank fermentation with citric acid, and that worked just as well. So, um, once the mass production began, um, I think it was Merck actually, um, actually supplied penicillin to treat the first human to survive a bacterial infection. And that was in 1942. I write about it in my story. It was a woman named Ann Miller and she got blood poisoning from a miscarriage she had and was deathly ill. And they treated her Merck. Um, it just so happened that one of the people who knew Howard Flory was in the ho same hospital that she was in. And so he contacted Flory and Merck was experimenting with it and sent um, penicillin up to help save her. And they actually saved her life. Um, in fact, her original lab results are in the Smithsonian right now and they list the penicillin treatment. So, um, but getting back to your question, um, what happened was all these drug companies got together and they all started mass producing it and the government administered it to the soldiers. So the War Production Board was in charge of getting it out to each soldier. You know, they put together kits for each soldier and inside that was also penicillin and for all the medics. So it basically was really a government and private industry collaboration. Don't ask me about patents <laughs> because that has come up and I, I don't know how they worked that out, but um, that was a big issue actually, because in England, um, if a scientist discovered a substance or a new drug, um, it was considered not a good thing to apply for a patent because scientists in England considered themselves doing good for the public. And so it was considered a crass commercial idea to get a patent and, and make money off of it. And when they all start, first started in the Oxford labs to experiment with penicillin, Ernst Chain is the German chemist um, who came on with them. And immediately he wanted to get a patent because in Germany, that was more common to do that, like it is in the United States. But all the British scientists thought that he was money grubbing and just reaching for fame, you know, and they wouldn't do it. Um, so eventually, um, you know, they did win the Nobel Prize. That was uh, Howard Florey, uh, Ernst Chain, and Fleming actually got credit in the Nobel Prize for the original discovery. Wow. We have one of our, we have a few uh, viewer questions. Uh, so Richard wants to know, are there notebooks that the scientists and engineers wrote about their experimental results and plans in back in the 1940s over at the Ag Lab in Peoria? I would like to know what the actual experiment was when they got a lot of penicillin to put uh, and what the rig looked like. And Lottie, you might be able to speak with that. We have uh, worked with some of the historian, well, scientist historians at the, um, at the USDA lab here. Yeah, I've seen um, some of, when I visited the ag lab, uh, 
they've done some of the setups for me, but I don't know if it was exactly the same. Um, it was, you know, so the beakers and um, the centrifuges. Um, so I can't speak exactly to what it looked like. I, I wish we had a picture. And I believe as Diane was, um, or actually Lisa. Oh, there you go, Renee. That's a, that's a great image. Um, yeah. And so we did, um, a couple years ago, we did an exhibition called the Bicentennial uh, Celebrate Illinois. And we had, as best we could, um, some of the materials that would have been used, um, but it wasn't a exact replica. Obviously the image we're looking at is um, probably much more accurate, but I do know that it, it was a pretty large setup. Um, it would be interesting to know, and Diane, I don't know if you know about this, um, was each chemist working from the same um, area or were there like 10 or 12 of these setups at the ag, at, uh, the ag lab? Do you know? I'm thinking back to um, a man named Eric Lax wrote a really good book about the early days of penicillin and, and I interviewed him for the story. And I think they were all working as a team on um, a collection of molds. So it really was a team effort. I don't know if they have notebooks and had saved that material. I do know that I think it's the Imperial War Museum in England has some notes from Fleming. I think his stuff is all in England and the Oxford University um, might have some of the material from the Oxford lab as well. Mm -hmm. As far as Peoria, I'm not really sure about that. And I would imagine it might be part of the National Archives as well. Yeah, I also think, um in talking with um, some of the scientists at the Ag Lab, that some of that information also is now up at the University of Chicago, in addition oh. to being in, in DC. Um, so unfortunately, I would love I would love to be able to look at some of that, as I'm sure uh, Lisa would, yep. uh, in an attempt to find um, her family member's name, which is just such an incredible story. Right. Um, and just, in reference to this question one more time, um, Renee, the image with the two female, um, either scientists or, or techs, um, that is more of what we had in the exhibition that I worked on um, with the Ag Lab. So I'm, again, I'm not totally sure what the full setup would have looked like. And I think it would have looked different in various areas. And the and the um, our our friends at the at the Ag Lab have provided us with um, images, and um, they're very proud, of course, of of this accomplishment of their lab, and have provided us with some images to use in our exhibitions and share. Um, I am unfortunately don't have them all loaded up here uh, to be able to share with you, but I do know that um, the that. This image here shows, I believe, one of the fermentation tanks that would have. Yes. Um, yeah. This. Uh, I see it. Yeah. Uh, we had another question um, from Barb. Uh, she wants to know what year did Moldy Mary find the cantaloupe and was it during the war? Hmm, interesting question. I think she found it in, let's see, uh, it has to be 1941, I think. Uh, Florian Heatley came to the lab in July, Peoria lab in July of 41, and then they worked through the rest of the year. And then by 1942, they were able to produce the millions of units. So I'm going to guess it's either 41 or 42. I don't have an exact date in front of me. I'd have to go through entire books to find the exact date. But um, it was after uh, we entered the war in December of 1941. And my guess is that it was after that. So yes, it was during the war. If anyone uh, viewing has any other questions, please feel free to leave us a comment on this video. We'll be happy to try to answer them for you. I wanna take this opportunity to mention that, um, that I think it's undoubtedly one of the proudest accomplishments of Peoria's uh, National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research Lab uh, that we contributed to the uh, mass production of penicillin. Um, but I want to also mention that 
the lab is is thriving today. There are really accomplished scientists who are working at our ag lab here in Peoria and still contributing to groundbreaking science. Um, right now, they're actually working on sort of a, an updated penicillin um, update to the penicillin drug. Uh, they're also working on some uh, some new agricultural um, products that could allow farmers to overwinter, uh, plant plant um, grasses in their fields in, in the winter that could then be harvested to use in oil. Um, they've done so many innovations through, and inventions through the year um, in the food that you eat um, and the products that you have in your home, oh, so much of it that we don't realize um, came from Peoria's Ag Lab. And um, there's a lot of really wonderful scientists working there today as there have been uh, throughout the years in, in Peoria. So we're very proud of the Ag Lab. Yeah. Yeah. And the scientists are, um, there's some efforts uh, by some of the scientists to make penicillin Illinois state microbe. So <laughs> stay tuned. Hopefully we learn more about that in the future. And just on the same note, um, Renee was talking, I, I feel like it, there have probably been so many amazing scientists um, that have worked and discovered materials at the Ag Lab. Um, but I just wanted to give a quick shout out since tomorrow is the celebration of um, the ratification, or not the ratification, but um, the 19th Amendment being adopted into the Constitution that um, a female scientist by the name of Eileen Jeans um, came out of the Ag Lab and actually did um, really impressive work with mass producing um, Dextran. And I can't go into too much on Dextran, um, but there were obviously some really amazing um, female scientists and techs that worked at the Ag Lab. So um, we're super thankful that we're even, even able to track some of their history and thankful to Lisa um, for wanting to learn more about her ancestors' history at the Ag Lab because oftentimes um, as crucial of a story as the penicillin is, sometimes the women get lost to history. So excited to, to talk a little bit about them tonight. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to tell my grandma's story and and um, you know many people and I think it I think it's very aligned with the situation we're dealing with today. A lot of unsung heroes working working behind the scenes to to help the greater good. So um, just thrilled to be able to and it, and through this, it's been a fantastic learning process. I too have learned a tremendous amount just about the the penicillin project overall and. Um, it's been an interesting treasure hunt to, to, to find different sources and photos and um, certainly grateful for some of the folks at the Ag Lab, specifically Patrick Dowd, Mark Burhau, and John Liu for helping me on my personal journey to, to get more information. They've been um, extraordinarily helpful. So wanted to give them a shout out too. Yeah. Many well, of them have been wonderful at the museum too. So thank you to all the scientists at the Ag Lab that we've worked with over the years. I think uh, I think we we don't have any other uh, viewer questions right now. So one last uh, shout out for viewer or call out for viewer questions. If we have any come in in the next moment, we'll be sure to answer them. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to Lisa and to Diane for joining us tonight, sharing some of the penicillin story uh, with us here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. I also wanted to thank the museum members and Visionary Society members for supporting the museum, our programming that we provide both in person at the museum and the virtual Peoria Riverfront Museum programming is um, available because of support from our community members and, and our uh, members. Uh, and I'd like to invite you to come to the museum. Uh, we have a lot of um, things in place to keep you safe while you visit uh, and you can see those penicillin strains in a, a case in a hallway exhibition uh, on the lower level of the museum so thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, we hope you have a wonderful night thank you thank you